Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Timing Research Show for uh, March 16th, 2015. Today we will be talking about the 77th weekly report from Timing Research. Uh, if you have not had a chance to look at this report yet, you can go to timingresearch.com slash reports and download it there. Uh, my name is David Cosmeter. I'm the creator of Timing Research. And again with me, I have Dave Landry uh, guest hosting for me this week. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. Thank you, David Cosmeter, for having me uh, back once again. Thanks for Timing Research. Um, we got, it looks like we've got a pretty good lineup this week. we got Ed Carlson. He's a friend of the show from Seattle Tactical Advisors. So let's start with Ed first. Ed, Ed, tell us a little bit about your trading for those of you, us who don't knew you, know you. Excuse me. And uh, Hello? Okay. Ed, can you I, hear us? I, I think I we lost Dave there, but uh, if – if I'm still on, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. This is Ed Carlson uh, from SeattleTechnicalAdvisors.com. Uh, we publish uh, daily, well, five days a week at the website for subscribers. And um, while uh, the website uh, includes traditional technical analysis of the equity, bond, and uh, uh, currency and commodity markets, uh, the uh, our, our niche is uh, the work of George Lindsay. I personally have written three books on uh, uh, Lindsay's work. Uh, for those that don't know the name, Lindsay was a, um, a well-known technician back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s uh, who wrote a newsletter for, oh, close to 35 years. Unfortunately, Lindsay never uh, uh, wrote a book uh, where he organizing all of his methods. So my work has been to... Uh, collect and, and preserve these old newsletters and try and figure out just what it was he was doing that enabled him to make such incredible uh, uh, forecasts. Um, if anybody's curious to get a little bit more on Lindsay, I've got a short video clip at my website that you can you can view. But uh, in a nutshell, that's what uh, that's what we do. Ed, how did you find Lindsay, and and, and what attracted you, attracted you to him? Oh, well, actually, um, a few years ago, I was doing these podcasts for the Market Technicians Association, and one of my very first uh, interviewees was uh, uh, Peter Eliades, who just quite by chance just happened to mention Lindsay when he was explaining something, and I, I stopped him, and I said, well, well who's, who's this Lindsay, and, and tell me more about him, and uh, Peter probably went on for longer about Lindsay than he should have, given it was his <laughs> interview and not Lindsay's, but... Uh, it was enough to get me interested, and so I uh, uh, I said, "Well, where can I find out more about him?" And Peter said he didn't know. He explained oh, wow. he'd written these newsletters, but uh, didn't know if anybody had them, and and he didn't know. Well, so we hung up, and at the time, I figured that was the end of that. But about thirty minutes later, he called me back, and he said, "You know, I think Investors Intelligence might have some of those old newsletters." Now, this is the benefit of institutional memory because when I called in Investors, well, I went to their website, and there was nothing there about about any Lindsay newsletters, and um, so um, uh, I picked up the phone and called him, and whoever answered said he'd never heard of it, but he'd ask around, and and what do you know? Ten minutes later, he came back and said, "Yeah, we do have some of those old newsletters." Oh wow! I, I said, "Well, great. How do I get them?" Well, that stumped him. He had to think about that for a minute, and finally he said, "You know." <laughs> If you send me a check for $30, I'll Xerox them for you. And so that, that was the beginning. And uh, then uh, I got a book contract uh, to, to write a book on it. And once word got out about that, then uh, a handful of people around the country uh, that had sat on these things for decades started sending what they had. And, and it just kind of snowballed from there. That's amazing. Wow. Sounds like the best 30 bucks you ever spent. <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, uh, next up we got Jason, and Jason, let me try your last name, Jakovsky. Jeff, uh, uh, you, you ever want? You guys remember the uh, TV show years ago, uh, uh, Bar Miller? Yeah. You guys remember, remember when Wojciechowicz would hold up his uh, thing and he'd say, "My name is pronounced Wojciechowicz," you know, just like it's spelled. Okay. Remember he would hold it up, Wojciechowicz, just like it's spelled. No one can pronounce my name, so it's it's Jankovsky. Jankowski. Uh, like well, that's not that yeah. hard once you hear it. <laughs> once you hear it, yeah. But I, I hear that all the time. Never offended by it. It's uh, it's a okay. Russian name, old Russian name, Eastern European. 
Cool. Uh, old old family name. Um, cool. Friend of the Czars before the revolution, but no one wants to talk about that. So. <laughs> Sounds like uh, fodder for some uh, some uh, bar talk. Maybe I'll have a beer or something. <laughs> I'll uh, take you up on it. Sounds good. Uh, Jason's over at the liononline.net. Jason, tell us a little bit about your trading, and tell us a little bit about the liononline.net. Okay. Well, that that's actually my website, and I kind of use it as a reference point for the education and broadcasting that I do, uh, which is uh, focused largely around foreign currency trading. I'm born and raised in this industry, really. Uh, I mean, I'm born in Chicago, raised in Chicago. Did my very first trade in Chicago Board of Trade, Big Board Corn, in 1986 as a customer and absolutely was hooked. Got into the business in uh, 87 as a registered Series 3 representative and uh, no longer registered. I just trade my own accounts and educate traders on um, how to improve their performance. So on my website, if you were to go to my website, you guys are all welcome to do that. Uh, you have a look at some of the things I do and... Um, um, some of the free content that's there on improving your rates of return, improving your performance. And I focus largely, guys, I, I, 90, I think trading is 99% psychology. I really think the market Amen. is incidental. You know, it is. It doesn't matter what the market is. Like, like you know, Richard Dennis said, I don't even need to know the name of the market to trade. Yeah, you know, absolutely. The market doesn't matter. It's your, it's your discipline that matters. And so I provide training and education and coaching on how to improve discipline to break those habits, things like running stops too close and, uh, you know, get, cutting profits short, adding to losers, all those things that every trader's done, I've done them, you know, we just need to develop a program and a plan in place to prevent those things from happening. So that's what I focus on. Yeah, amen. And it's it's almost like until you do those things, you're not going to not do them, <laughs> if that makes any right, sense. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, Jason, I was a CTA for about 14 years, so I'm familiar oh, with good for you. what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, next up, we got Jim Kenny of Option Professor. Dot com. Thank you, Jim, for having a name that's a little easier to pronounce. Uh -huh. so, uh, tell us a little bit about your no, – no offense, Jason, but tell us a, a little bit about your trading and uh, tell us a little bit about optionprofessor.com well, for those of you, you, us who don't know you. Sure. Uh, Option Professor um, uh, has um, DVDs that educate people on the uses and the risks of the different option strategies, both from the buy side and the sell side. So we go over on the seven DVDs, which is about five and a half hours of material broken down by – um, different tactics, uh, writing strategies, and hedging strategies using collars and things like that, and also um, uh, two-sided strategies, your strangles and your straddles and all that kind of stuff. And we try to give people a, a good education on how they work, and then they could paper trade it and see which strategy they may uh, want to use for a certain circumstance. Uh, I provide the content for them, and I've been uh, doing seminars for you know decades. It used to be all live in hotel rooms and at the money shows and all that kind of stuff, and now it's morphed into the webinar type approach, which is you know pretty much the modern way to do seminars. And so basically, you know, obviously I'm very knowledgeable in the subject matter, and I present a very good balanced uh, ideas on how these things can work. Yeah, a lot of moving parts with options. So education yeah. is. Uh, Pretty crucial there. Good stuff, uh, Jim. Uh, I'm Dave Landry. For those of you who don't know me, you can find me at DaveLandry.com. I've been at this for a long time. As I was just telling Jason a second ago, I was a CTA for about 14 years. I gravitated towards stocks oh, probably 15 years ago. I'll trade any market that moves, but I like stocks because there's an inefficiency there that's hard to find in other markets, although occasionally uh, efficient markets can make inefficient moves, and I have an article coming out on that uh, soon in Traders Magazine, so if you're interested... Um, let me know. I also have a 21-page report on my methodology. Uh, I take a swing to intermediate term approach. I think you could only predict the short term when it comes to markets. I think anyone can only predict the short term uh, when it comes to markets. Part of my disclaimer screen is all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So I think you could only really, again, predict the short term, not to beat a dead horse. But then if positions work, you could stay with them longer term, and sometimes we'll have – a swing trade, which will turn into a longer-term trade, will actually hold on for years. When people ask me my holding time, I say ideally 10, 15 years or, or more. But the reality is the money management takes you out often um, much sooner than that. Again, just shoot me an email if you want some more information. Okay, Ed, you're up, you're up again uh, first uh, today on the uh, question of the week. Based on any technical or fundamental indicators you want to use, would you predict that the S&P 500 will move higher or lower by the end of this week? And that's Friday's close of the 20th, and after you make your prediction, go ahead and give us your 
confidence on a scale of zero to ten, with zero being no confidence and ten being extremely confident? Well, um, my uh, my work with Lindsay has has evolved past uh, what what he had originally come up with, which was these long term forecasts, and uh, I'm I'm now have what I call a hybrid Lindsay uh, model, in which I I try and make uh, forecasts such as you're asking about right now. Uh, the the latest forecast called for a low uh, March sixth to ninth Friday, last Friday or, or, or well previous Friday or Monday the ninth. Uh, it looks like the forecast was off by two days with Wednesday's low, and uh, however we're looking for a real short run here up until um, well the next the next forecast is unfortunately for this Friday or the following Monday. Uh, with a, uh, a cycle high due on Thursday in the NASDAQ, it, we could see the thing off, you know, the high could come a day early. But uh, very high confidence, say let's give it a 9, that um, will be higher by the end of the week. Oh, fantastic. Good uh, good confidence. I like that forecast too. And, and that should be, that should be a, a tradable high that would take <clears throat> us down into a low uh, at the very end of the month. Or, you know, March 30 is the, is the single date point forecast uh, and it you know, it can be off by a couple of days. Okay. Yeah, there's no, there's no exacts in this business, that's for sure. Uh, all right, Jason, same question. Based on any technical fundamental indicators you want to use, would you predict that the S&P 500 will move higher or lower next week, and that's the close of March 20th? And then rate your confidence of 0 to 10 on your answer. And one thing I left out, too, is um, towards the end of the show, we'll have a recap. So if there's anything you leave out, about the market or anything you want to uh, touch upon towards the end of the show, you have time to do that too. Well, I would have to say I agree with Ed because uh, I think it's more of a fundamental play at this point. I think the psychology of the market is is prepped. The psychology is ready for the Fed to take the punch bowl away. And I think that if they, on Wednesday, the Fed says, uh, we're leaving the word patient in there, um, I think that the mar that's probably the most closely this is probably the most closely watched Fed meeting I think in recent memory is you know because it's a big question if the Fed goes on a you know a, 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 a policy of raising rates which I think that that's what the market is expecting that would signal if patience was taken out then most analysts I talk to most traders I've been in touch with are all taking the point of view then that signals the Fed's um, uh, tacit approval to the market expectation that rate hikes are happening sooner, probably you know as early as June. Some people think. So if patience is left in there, I think people are going to look at that and say Fed's going to be on hold a lot longer than we thought, and that's just going to keep the money you know uh, loose. And I think that that would probably bode well for a rally. I think at that point there might be a knee-jerk volatility and all that, but I, I would argue that from where we are now, I think the S and P is going to be higher by Friday. And I think we'll close higher on the week. You know, we're coming off a couple of corrective weeks anyway. You know, so yeah, I think that, and I, I really believe that the Fed. I don't think the Fed. Well, some people would argue this. I don't. I don't believe that the Fed is run by idiots. You know, uh, but some people would argue that. <laughs> and you know, uh, I don't think that with the dollar making this big a move in nine or twelve weeks, I can't see them saying, "Oh, well, that's just gonna. That's not a problem. Let's just go ahead and hike rates and let the dollar rise even further." You know, I don't. I don't think that, yeah. because it's already affecting the economy. It's already showing up every piece of data. Look at today's data. Today's data was not that good. It just doesn't say. You know, it doesn't come. Nothing comes across the table in the last twelve weeks. Hats and horns screaming. The Fed's got to raise rates. It's all basically bearish. So I think the Fed is going to keep their foot on the pedal a little longer. I don't think that they're going to take patience out of the uh, statement. And I think the market is going to see that as more room to go to the upside. Yeah. And then, as it's uh, as people have said on this show before, and I forget who said it, uh, uh, Europe is like taking a page out of our book and using a bazooka over there to try to get things going. So that's kind of interesting. Well, you know, uh, I, you know, you know, what's interesting too. I don't know if you saw this, but last week net inflows into the eurozone were higher than they've been in recent uh, memory, as well as outflows of uh, net liquidation of U.S. assets by foreign investors. So. If you look at how much money left the U.S. and how much money went to Europe, it's like the market is approving that the po the potential is better in Europe now than it's been in a long time, and we we got to get some of that. And I think that 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 bodes well for a top in the dollar, but there is no top yet. You know, it, it's yeah. not there yet. You know, so yeah. until that I mean, happens, I don't think the Fed can lift rates. 
Yeah, there's definitely a bubble and a dollar, and I think uh, I like trading bubbles. I think bubbles are wonderful, but they do end badly, and that's why you have to have a, a chair for when they stop. But then sometimes you can play the other way. Like earlier I said, um, I'm not a big fan of some of these efficient markets like uh, like Jason's trading with, uh, with the FX, but if you pick your spots carefully uh, – especially when you get some bubbles and all, some uh, great things can happen and you can catch some good trades. Okay, uh, uh, Jim, let's go over to you, Jim Kenny of optionprofessor.com. Uh, based on any technical or fundamental indicators you want to use, mm -hmm. would you predict that the S&P index will move higher or lower? Oh, uh, did we get your uh, confidence, Jason? I'm sorry. Uh, what's your confidence on your um, uh, prediction of the S&P 500? Okay, well, I, I really believe it's based on how, what the Fed does Wednesday. So without knowing that, it's really I would have to say I'm only at 50% because, you know, okay. if, they, if they take it out, I would be very surprised if the, the S&P finishes higher. But yeah. if, they leave, if they leave it in, you know, whoosh. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, none of us have a crystal ball. That's why we have stops. <laughs> yeah, okay, I, Jim I would Kenny. say I'm only at 50%. Then, you know. <laughs> All right, yeah. fantastic. No problem. Okay, Jim, uh, same question to you. Based on any technical fundamental indicators you want to use, would you predict that the S&P 500 will move higher or lower this week? Uh, that's a close of Friday the 20th. And uh, based on your prediction, uh, go ahead and give us a uh, uh, a raking or of, of confidence with zero being no yeah. confidence and 10 being extremely confident. Well, I think we're going to rename this segment professional guessing, right? Yeah, well, that's what it is. <laughs> Come on, let's be honest, you know. All right, so anyway, here's my view. Uh, basically, uh, my opinion, my guess on this is is that uh, the market has uh, about, uh, you know, on the S&P I'm, I'm referring to, has uh, a pretty good uh, resistance 2080 to, tw uh, to 2100 so today we went up to almost 2080 and we've turned down a little bit so I'm kind of thinking along the lines of you know my thing on this would be to watch that VIX you know we got, we got options expiration this week so obviously things can be jockeying around quite a bit we also have Yellen talking as you guys were mentioning and they are bidding it up a little bit and you know the liquidity of the market's probably not that great because um, if you look at the numbers uh, you know, anytime, well, the, the volume's, what, 75% lower over the last five years. So anything that comes out is obviously exacerbated because the liquidity is not so great. So if everybody wants to buy, they raise the big offer, and then the other day everybody wants to sell, they drop it down. So bottom line is is that uh, what I think the market will do is I think uh, I'll be watching the VIX. And if it uh, stays above 1525, uh, then the likelihood of a drop going into Friday, uh, I think, would be higher. And if it breaks under 1525, uh, then I think uh, the rally would be better. So right now, I mind, I'd guess is that uh, we got maybe 20 points up, and then it's going to roll over. Uh, so by Friday, it could very well be lower. Um, you know, than it is today. But that doesn't mean it couldn't go up towards 2100 before it does it. So my view is more uh, neutral to negative. And uh, basically, uh, that VIX is going to really give me a big indicator of uh, of what it's doing. If it ever breaks above 16.75.17, I think the drop will be more exacerbated and more aggressive. So keep an eye on the VIX. I and you know, in my view, in my opinion, because it could be a good uh, indicator on what the market's uh, up to. And uh, like the gentleman was saying about Yellen, you know, uh, it could be they're bidding it up in advance because they say the dollar is so strong, uh, you know, that they won't raise and this kind of thing. So if there's any surprise there with the lack of liquidity, you know, you could get some significant moves going into Friday. One thing that you guys also have talked about in the past is uh, the re re uh, reversion to the mean. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, just because this is an informational uh, type uh, form, uh, you know, some of the things that I'm uh, seeing is, is, you know, the long term moving averages on the monthly graph that I use, that I look at on the dollar index is around 84. We're trading at 100. Uh, crude oil, it's at 89. We're trading at 43. Uh, SPX, you know, it's at 1875. We're up at 2100 almost. NASDAQ uh, up at 4900. Long term averages are 3900 ballpark area. So, you know, are we ever going to revert back to the means at all to these moving averages? That's, uh, I think, uh, pretty much of a larger question that we want to keep an eye on as well. And uh, it'll be interesting to see in the next, you know, week or month or something if these things can just uh, disregard. Um, 
their technical condition versus these moving averages and just throw it to the side and keep moving, or yeah. if, in fact, you'll bounce back. And then, of course, like the deflationary uh, thing. I don't know if anybody's going to talk about that at all, but, you know, you're down at 43 and change on the oil again, yeah. and your gold is at 1150, uh, and they're both kind of holding on for dear life. So, you know, if you broke underneath 40 on the oil and you broke under uh, 1140, 1120 on the gold, I don't know if that's going to make any difference, but it would certainly be a, a deflationary signal a little bit that way, huh? Yeah, we'll get to we'll, you know save some of that fodder for um, the next question because uh, we'll flesh that out because good stuff though. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned reversion to the mean because right now uh, I think the S and P 500 is stretched a little bit to the downside. One thing I don't like. Oh, did we get your confidence? I'm sorry, you're you're down. Yeah, my, con my confidence level, uh, you know, is obviously very much based on how that VIX works out. So if that VIX were to break under 1525, the idea of it rising would be uh, a seven, and if it breaks uh, above 1675, it would be like a nine that we're going to go down. All so, right, well you're going to have to give me one though. <laughs> oh, if I give you one, it'll be to, uh, to the downside, and it would be a six. All right, fantastic, no problem. Hey, I'll answer um, your questions, Your Honor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> answer the question. You can't yeah. handle the truth. Hey, Judge uh, Judy, I, I understand what we're doing. Yeah. I hear you. I hear yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, who was it earlier, Ed, or uh, I think it was Jason said something about professional guessing. And, you know, sometimes it's tough. I had some. Uh, I, I always preach you could only predict the short term when it comes to markets. And, and one of my clients thought that that meant you could always predict the market. And you can't always predict the market. Sometimes it's just choppy. Uh, but I do think that the S&P is due for a bounce in here, or more bounce than we even see it today. I mean, we're up 1% already today. Um, it's There's a variety of things I'm looking at. First of all, I'm a 100% technical trader, so I don't worry too much about the news. But it is climbing to all the worry. I, I I don't necessarily take a peek, but I do get a little bit through osmosis. And one thing with the doom and gloom and advantage that uh, us guys in here have, being on the educational and advisory side of the business, as we get to uh, feel the pulse of a lot of people out there, and it seems to me, and maybe this is just the more trader types, but every time this market has a down tick, my inbox is filled with all this doom and gloom, and this is the uh, this is the top, and and then the market somehow goes on to make new highs again. Now, eventually, they'll be right, and as I wrote today's column, predict early and often. Uh, one thing that I also was talking about today, and it's something that I don't use that much, but uh, this show reminded me of it last week or week before. Whenever the market begins to slide a little bit, I, I have to remind myself to plot the 50-day moving average, a simple moving average for the 50-day. And that's something that I don't uh, plot that often unless the market begins to slide. And it's kind of interesting that we did dip below it, and now we're back up at, above it again today. Uh, not that you want to trade those crosses, but it, when the market stays above it for a significant amount of time, I, a lot of times you'll get a trend developing. I call that daylight. So uh, if you just traded daylight when the market stays above that moving average for a while, I think in general you would um, be on the right side of the trend. So for now, because the market's above the 50-day moving average, I'm going to err on the side of the trend. The only thing I don't like, uh, market being the S&P 500, the only thing I don't like is we're stuck back in this range and we've gone sideways for quite a while. So I, I think you should pick your spots carefully. Uh, let me give you my prediction before I wrap that up. I think the Prediction will be higher. I'm going to err on the side of a longer-term trend here, much longer-term trend, and the fact that we're above the 50 again. And I'm going to give it a confidence of about six. I'm not. Uh, I think, like um, both uh, Ed and Jason and Jim all said, there's a lot of variables that are unfolding in here. So I think a lot of things could happen uh, during the week that could that could change things quite a bit. But so far, again, seems like this market has climbed a wall of worry. One thing I kind of find fascinating is. Uh, the market didn't care about interest rates until, I guess it was like last Friday or Friday before last. I forget exactly when, when we had the big down day. And then rates have since uh, backed up to a level where they were before the rate scare. So rates uh, spiked up and then came right back in. If you look at like the TLT, uh, let me just pull it up real quick. It's trading back around. I don't know what's doing today. I haven't looked at it. But uh, coming in today, it was trading right about where it was a few weeks ago. In fact, today it's even higher. Uh, so you can go back before we even had this big slide that was based on interest rates. So I think it was um, I think it was Jim that was saying it, it's the reaction to all this that matters and not the absolute numbers in and of themselves. So, again, I'm going to go uh, higher and with a low confidence of about uh, six on that. Now, um, now's the time we, we get to elaborate a little bit on these things. So, Ed, let's start with you. Uh, what developing events, and they can be technical or fundamental, 
will you be watching out for this week that might have a positive or negative impact on the S&P 500 and other U.S. markets? You know, um, boy, I hope this is going to answer your question. Um, watching a number of things that, uh, well, for example, back to my, my hybrid forecasts uh, for a, a high this week, late this week, or early next, and a, a low at the end of the month. Uh, from there, these would these would uh, uh, cement uh, cycle expectations. Last time I was on here, we were talking. I was talking about a both a 14 month cycle and a 21 week cycle that called for a low in March, and and I think uh, probably last week's low was low enough to make that one show up on the chart. But uh, got some non lindsay indications that uh, that March 30 uh, low might be lower than the one we saw last week. So uh, not uh, not planning on sticking with this long position in my own accounts for very long, obviously. Uh, then there is a a 35 week cycle high that's due in May, and now that's real exciting to me because uh, in addition to that, we've got uh, what Lindsay called a three peaks and domed house formation showing on the charts. The first uh, peak was back. Back in December of 2013, peaks two and three were in July and September of 2014. We've gone through what he called a five-wave reversal uh, late last year, early this year, and now we're heading on up for the top of the, the domed house. Um, that thing counts uh, uh, to May 25th as the top for the bull market. And so that, that matches up with our cycle expectations as well. Uh, you know, Dave, this bull market this thing, this is the, the the longest bull market in post-war history, yeah. and it, it it's also the third strongest rise we've ever seen since 1900. And you look back and you see what were the what was number one and number two. Well, 1929 and and the, the bull market that ended in 2000. So these things yeah. don't end well, and that's what uh, the Three Peaks Domed House is telling us that uh, we got a problem coming up here. And the only thing I would add to that is that uh, for some technical reasons, it's quite possible that uh, the next time I'm looking for, April 15th, could actually end up being the, the top. Uh, it's, it's a low probability uh, occurrence, but uh, it, it is there, and it's got me a little worried. Okay. I didn't realize Lindsay was three peaks in a dome. I, that's, uh, oh, that's yeah. I love these shows. That's why I keep coming back because I this is where I learn about learn a lot about technical analysis. Well, you know what? I'll uh, just I'll just throw this out real quick then. Yeah, um, for any for anybody listening to the program today, uh, if you want to shoot me an email through my website, SeattleTechnicalAdvisors.com, I would be more than happy to share a, a copy of the, what I call the March Lindsay Report. It's a report that comes out every month, and I usually sell it. Uh, but uh, if you just let me know you were listening to the call today. Um, Shoot me an email through contact us on the website, and I'd be glad to send you a free copy. Okay, boom. All right, Jason Jankowski. That's a little closer than I was earlier. <laughs> what developing events, and they could be technical or fundamental, will you be watching out for this week, ending uh, Friday the 20th, that might uh, have a positive or negative impact on the S&P 500 and other U.S. markets? Well, I... I, I... I, I got to believe that this FOMC meeting is going to be the big thing for the week. It's yeah. going to set the tone for the whole thing. So I, I'm I'm going to go with that. And I think if you add the technicals on top of that, um, I think a move over the um, 20, uh, 20, 85 to 90 area, I think will will make a, a push. I think there'll be enough interest for the the early sellers to bail, and we'll get a first through the even scenario. I don't know if if um, your listeners are familiar with that. You probably know what that is where market makes a round number, you know, like 10,000 in the Dow, you know, it's sold off after that, you know, it makes a round number that is important to everybody's, it's close enough to their technical figures, it causes people to pause, it gives them a minute to think and, and sit back and think, and so I think, you know, we get the right stuff and the right help from the Fed, then you could see the market hit 20, 80, 85, a little stop-driven rush all the way to 21, and then a pullback. Because I think 2100 is a real big psychological number for people to hold, grab onto, like 2000 was. Yeah. You know, so I think it might be a first through the even scenario. Uh, but I'm also going to be watching, of course, the dollar. And I think crude is a real important part of this. I really do. I think dollar is way overextended. Uh, your other guest, I think it was Ed, or maybe it was um, uh, Jim, said that, um, you know, he, he was watching the reversion to the mean. 
Now you look at the weekly dollar index, and you're at 84 and a half or 85 on a 50 bar moving average for the weekly. I mean, you're 15 handles. <laughs> yeah. You know, nine weeks ago. I mean, it's just it just it's begging for a sell off. You know. Mm -hmm. So if um, uh, the dollar uh, has a correction uh, based on what happens with the Fed, I think that the dollar slamming lower for a period of time is 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 very likely. And I think that would cause a pause in the S&P as well, I think, you know, me personally. I think that would accelerate the interest in the Fed raising rates because I think the Fed, if the Fed doesn't raise rates, you're going to get a, a, a knee-jerk reaction. Or they don't signal a rate hike is coming, I should say. You're going to get a knee-jerk reaction and then some liquidation that may turn into a full-blown retracement on the dollar. And I think, you know, people are going to take the point of view, well, now that the dollar isn't a problem anymore, the Fed can raise rates, and they're going to extrapolate that to mean that there's no more upside due in the markets for a period of time, and that um, if the dollar starts to sell off, it could take S&Ps with it, and I think that what would be the confirmation on that would move back above the 50 handle in crude. Yeah, um, it's, it's it's like Justice Power, uh, Potter Stewart. We'll know it when we see it. In, in this right. work and technical analysis, it, it's great stuff, and I tell all my clients, read Murphy's book on the subject and learn all you can about it. But the, the reality is there's couplings and decouplings, and it only matters when it right. matters. And, and there's sometimes when you really want to pay close attention to the dollar, and other times you just forget about it. But, yeah, I like what you said. I mean, if, if uh, you know, maybe we get a sell-off of the dollar. Maybe we get the dollar sell-off out the way, and then people realize, well, it wasn't that bad, and we'll see what happens. I mean, it's just a lot it's of like, things it, could happen it, out there. Was it uh, – I forget who it was that said this, but it's a, it's a great quote, and I use it a lot in my, my you know, focus every day is the markets can remain irrational longer than I can remain liquid. Right, so, absolutely. You know, I'm, trying, I'm trying to sell into this top in the dollar if there's a yeah. top forming, and you got to be careful because you got to run your stops. You can't argue with it. You know, wait for the next signal if you still feel like you're topping, you know, but you, you've got to stay focused on uh, your discipline more than anything else because, you know, I, I've had the, the pleasure of being there at the right time and price to sell a top or buy a bottom, when other people just wouldn't do it. I mean, I look at the sentiment on some of these markets right now, and it's it's like in above the 90s on one side. Yeah. I mean, that's just that's just a recipe for disaster. And I mean, it's been six weeks like that in the dollar, you know. Uh, so it's overdue. Right. Right. And, but my argument, my argument is is that trends last longer and go much further than most are willing to believe, and that's why. That's true, I, yeah. I'm the, I think that's yeah, what's I'm, happening. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm the trend following moron. I'll stick with it until the. Uh, until stopped out, but no, good stuff. Uh, good stuff on that, Jason. Okay, Jim, um, you um, you're up next. Uh, what developing events that can be technical or fundamental would you be watching for? Or Jim, did you just go? I, I'm, I, I don't have your pictures on my screen. No, I didn't go for the. Uh, okay, you didn't get to go on this one. Okay. Uh, what right. developing events and they can be technical or fundamental? Well, thanks for waiting so patiently, so sure. quietly over there. <laughs> I'm a listener, man. I'm listening. There you go. They can be technical or fundamental. Will you be watching out for this week that might have a positive or negative impact on the S&P 500 and other U.S. markets? Well, again, you know, the reason everyone is kind of a little bit uh, back and forth on their confidence level is that we are in the middle of a trading range uh, on the S&P, 2120 ballpark on the upside, 2040 on the downside. We're trading at 2070 something. So obviously, it is uh, it could break either way. And that's what this uh, VIX uh, indicator that I'm watching uh, is trying to help me see where the next move could be. Uh, so again, you know that would be the one that I'd be trying to keep a little bit of an eye on. Um, you'd like it to stay above the 1525 area and 1675 to 1700. So that's in a window as well. And uh, the way it breaks out of that window might be uh, some significance. You know, um, one thing that's overriding my concern in the market is that uh, the transports made their high in uh, the end of November. Yeah. And uh, the Dow or the S&P and stuff made their high at the end of February. So we haven't had a new high on the Dow and so I mean on the transports. So, you know, maybe there's a little bit of something there. And then I look at some individual companies like Qualcomm. You know, they had a pretty good spike up because they announced some things about buybacks and uh, increasing their dividend. But the, the uh, you know, the move from uh, up to 74 has already, it was about a five-point pop. And that five-point pop has already dissipated. And so, you know, it's, uh, you know, I, I come back to uh, what I read sometimes with this Paul Tudor Jones and his 200-day moving average. You know, if you take bearish strategies out, 
while the market has a primary 200-day uh, average rising. Uh, more times out of not, you might not be very happy with the result. So the bottom line is to be uh, negative uh, considerably up here is uh, not in line. Uh, the major trend, as you guys were saying, uh, basis a lot of these moving averages does remain up, and that's what makes it a tough racket to get on the sell side of the dollar or the sell side of uh, you know some of these things. Uh, the buy side of oil, you know, everybody it went into the 50s on oil; it's already back in 43. Yeah. So the bottom line is, is these major uh, moving average trends certainly have you have to respect them in some uh, in some effects, and you'll find sometimes that a lot of your trades that aren't working are fighting that major tape, and that's one of the problems. So getting back to your question though, what is the stuff on a short-term basis? I'd like to keep a little bit of an eye on this VIX, and I'd like to see if the VIX can hold that range one way or the other, and if it breaks out of that range, probably you know maybe go with it would be a, a guess. Okay. Well, I'm a 100% technical trader, so um, I was, again, I learned things uh, during these shows, and I get my news through osmosis, so I learned that there is a Fed meeting this week. I learned a few weeks back that, I, I'm guessing Yellen is the is the head of the Fed now. Um, I thought we still had <laughs> helicopter Ben, and uh, my wife tells me, I, I say this every show, she goes, stop admitting that, but I don't, I, that's how little I pay attention to all this. I have a TV in my office, a, a big uh, a big screen TV, and I use it as an extra monitor, but not as an actual uh, uh, TV, at least not for uh, any news-related channels. Um, so I am 100% technical. I'm keeping an eye on the S&P 500. I'd love for us to get out of this range. Uh, one thing that I'm, I'm looking at the S&P 500 is you can go all the way back, at least coming into today. It might be a little bit different today uh, with, with today's rally, but you can go all the way back to, let's say, mid-November, so that's uh, several months here where we haven't made any forward progress on a net-net basis. And I often tell people that when it comes to markets, people will ask me about a stock or a market or whatever. And I'll say, yeah, I, I see what you mean. You know, maybe long, long-term uptrend still in place. But what has it done lately? What has it done the last couple of weeks? What's the last couple of months? Last, uh, or further out, maybe even six months. And a lot of times, markets just kind of go sideways. They, people forget that a market can actually go sideways. goes up, goes down and goes sideways, but um, I think uh, we're going to get a little reversion to the mean was mentioned quite a bit. I think we got a little stretch to the downside. I think the market got a little oversold, at least basis of the S&P 500, and now it's coming back. Uh, I agree with some of the things that I think Jim was saying. It's hard for me to keep track today. My apologies, because you guys need to turn on your webcams next time, but uh, that's okay. Um, but uh, my apologies for that. But I think Jim was saying that the transports have topped out or are certainly going sideways. And, and that's one thing that I noticed because I watch everything. I'm not too worried about that. Right now, I think tech is uh, doing pretty good. Your uh, semiconductors look pretty good. Uh, and some of these other tech areas like biotech still look pretty good and drugs are still doing uh, fairly well in here. Outside of tech, you got retail still in a rally. These interest rate sensitive areas like utilities and real estate have gotten cream lately. I don't know if that's a shot across the bow or if the market could rally without those areas. So you, you have to watch everything in this business. So I am keeping an eye on that. Uh, I do like, again, the action in tech. The NASDAQ doing pretty good so far, rallying on a pullback in here. And the big indicator that I'm watching, or I should say it's an index, but the indicator maybe is a good for you to slip on that, is a Russell 2000. And I wrote this morning in my column that I don't think you can have a bear market as long as the Russell 2000 is at all-time highs. Uh, as a as a trader of inefficient momentum stocks, uh, I'm a big fan of the Russell 2000. The more I, I study the indicator, the more, the, or there it is again, the indicator, the more I study the index, the more I like it because it's so broad-based and it represents a lot of the stocks that I actually trade. So I think as long as that Russell stays up here, I, I wouldn't bet my life that we're going to stay up here forever, but uh, as a trend follower, and some people say a trend following moron, as long as a rusty Russell, or I call it the rusty, as long as the rusty's hanging in there, and as long as the Nasdaq stays above its range, I'm not going to get too excited about the sideways action in the um, in the S&P 500. So so yeah. far so good, but check back often. Dave, I'd I'd agree with you, and just throw this in into the mix. You know, at the highs in 2000 and 2007, we saw divergences in the rusty. Uh, you know, it turned down before the broader market did. Um, yeah. One caveat to that, however, is if you look at relative performance of the Russell 2000 all the way back to uh, 1999, I think. I'm going from memory here, and that's always a mistake for me. Um, <laughs> there's a big uh, a trend channel, bullish trend channel, but we broke down out of that a couple months ago. Oh. So that's uh, you know that's longer term, right? Yeah. But uh, for the short term, for what we're all talking about, uh, I'm with you right there. 
Yeah, and then you know, Adam, glad you brought that up. And I'm going to go again. I love these shows, so I get I get, I get so much uh, fodder for research from them. I'll go back in and study that. But one thing that I saw, I remember seeing, I should say, in 2007, was the market basis the S&P 500 was making marginal new highs, but I couldn't find a long setup to save my life. And I actually apologized to people in my trading service saying, guys, I, I just can't find, and it was, I think it was October 2007. And so I started putting shorts on the service and they started working and I still couldn't find any longs. And before you knew it, uh, you know, of course the media announces a bear market towards the, uh, towards the end of it in 2008. But uh, there were signs long before. Now I'm not saying everything is rosy now, but it doesn't feel like a 2007, and I'm going to use the caveat of yet in there. Uh, Ed, while we're on you, um, what advice would you give and or what resources would you recommend to someone who is new to trading? Wow. Um, well, you know, I guess I could give a different answer every time I appear on the program. I think today's answer will be uh, a book uh, aptly named Technical Analysis by uh, Kirkpatrick and Dahlquist. Uh, you know, for years, for decades, the uh, the Bible of technical analysis has been uh, the Edwards uh, McGee book, um, uh, Technical Analysis of Stock Trends. But this book uh, by Kirkpatrick and Dahlquist, which came out a few years ago, this really is the new Bible of technical analysis. So anybody that's interested in it, uh, in the topic, uh, that that's that's the resource. Well, I'm going to plus one on that book because I'm in that book. I'm pretty hey. sure. So <laughs> I think I am. Uh, uh, Charlie has uh, referenced me a couple times before. So I'm, I'm, I think I'm in that book. But if I'm not, uh, then shame on me for not knowing that. But uh, th that's a good uh, – anything else, Ed, you'd recommend for uh, – is, or what advice and or resources would you recommend for someone new to trading? <laughs> oh, Dave, I just went to we the index. We can go on for an hour, can't we? <laughs> I, I just went to the index of the book. Uh, Dave Landry, comma, David, page 370. All right, I'm in there. All right, cool. <laughs> Thank you. No, I for a second, I got a little nervous. So, uh, other other than my own, other than uh, my website, no, um, yeah. nothing. All right, well, I, I, that's good answers. Um, okay, Jason, uh, you're next. Uh, what advice would you give and or resources would you recommend to someone who is new to trading? That's a, a great question, and I can't give you a two-cent answer to it because I, I really believe that it's all psychology. I think that uh, analysis and all the rest has a very important and legitimate place, but it's got to be tempered with more, I think, personal responsibility and some hard choices on how you manage your behavior. So I, I would have to tell you that if, if the guy was brand new, never traded before in his life, I, I would say the single best piece of advice I could give you is don't paper trade more than just a reasonable period of time. Get, open an account, the smallest account you can trade, Yeah. and if, even if it's making or losing bus fare at the end of the week, you got to get in there with real money. Otherwise, you're never going to face the real issues that you personally are going to have once it's your money on the line. I mean, I tell you, you guys don't know. You've seen guys take, you know, make millions of dollars paper trading and then they open a real account and they blow out in 90 days you know Jason, my, so, I have a quote on that I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader right right <laughs> well, I, as far as resources go and you know I don't I don't want to uh, toot my own horn too much and I'm, I'm like everybody here I'd love to have more clients following my lead but I do I'll be more than happy to just give away a copy of my ebook top 10 mistakes it's the top 10 mistakes Forex traders make uh, but it applies to any kind of trading, stocks, futures, options. They're all the same, in, in the bedrock psychology. And I'll be happy to do that. All you got to do is, is tell me you want to post it on your site or something for your listeners. I'll be happy to give you a copy of a, that ebook, and they can all have, get a copy of it for free. And in there, I talk about all the things that most people make as a mistake in their yeah. first trading account. And if you can avoid a lot of those, you can shorten your learning curve. But don't think for a minute you're going to read a book on brain surgery and do it next Saturday night. You know, it's you're just not. So you can't think about trading that way. You got to think of it as a legitimate, serious uh, choice you're making, and you've got to put capital towards your education, and you've got to be willing to start small so you don't blow yourself up, and and be willing to learn the lessons you need to learn. It's not it, there's a, it's the only way to beat the 90% that lose odds. You know, it, it, really think it through before you start trading, is what I would tell a guy. That's that's good stuff, and I'm and I'm gonna dovetail on a lot of things that uh, that you did that you said. Uh, before we get to that, uh, Jim, uh, what advice would you give, and or what resources would you recommend to someone who is new to trading? 
Well, on the options front, which is uh, kind of uh, my forte on this, uh, on the written form, obviously, I've always uh, mentioned the uh, Larry McMillan book, Options as a Strategic Investment, a very good read. And then on the um, audiovisual, uh, obviously, the Option Professor DVDs that I put together for the Option Professor, I think, are very balanced, informative, and easy uh, to follow. So, and then, of course, you know, get back to, uh, you know, not every strategy is right for everybody, so try to find strategies that are appropriate to your circumstances. And, um, you know, again, uh, some of the uh, moving average information uh, that you could uh, look into would probably be somewhat helpful to try to follow trends. And, uh, you know, then, of course, the money management have parameters around your trades and have, uh, you know, only X amount of dollars, if you can, at risk on trades so that if they don't go well, you have obviously uh, powder to work with. And if they do go well, you'll see the account grow. So, you know, basically, uh, you know, money management parameters, uh, uh, the written word with uh, uh, Macmillan and the uh, audiovisual with the option professor would not be a bad starting pl uh, point uh, to get into. Yeah. I I agree with uh I agree with all that and in fact I agree with uh, a lot of the things that that uh, all three of you guys said today. Um, I was I'm a member of the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts and uh, last year's conference we had Tom McClellan speak to us and, and I don't remember a lot about what he I'm sure he talked a little bit about McClellan oscillator and some other things I'll have to check my notes on that but the one thing that I walked away with is something that he said. And, and it makes so much sense, especially for people that are just starting out in trading or trying to figure everything out. And he said that when you buy a stock, you're forming a relationship with the company. And, of course, you expect the company to do good things. And every now and then, obviously, the company will do something bad, like the CEO of what, HP or whatever got involved with the with a ex porn star and blah, blah, blah. You know, the stock loses a, a billion dollars overnight or whatever it is. So those kind of things can happen. But you are kind of expecting a company to do good things, and, and that's just expected. But what many people forget is that you're also forming a relationship with anyone else who has ever bought the stock and still owns it. And, and as Tom says, those people will screw you, and it's true. And another friend of mine who's also in the organization was at the same meeting, uh, Dick Fruth. He's, over, he's a money manager in Houston. And one thing that he told me and he wrote about in his book is uh, – that he was a broker back when people would actually come in and hand you the shares to sell before you got to the money management business and the other brokers would just take the shares, sell them and then kick the person out the office and if you know Dick he's a very personal guy he would sit him down give him a cup of coffee I, I imagine and start chit and chat with him and he said rarely did anyone ever come in to sell a stock because there was something wrong with the company. They were getting a divorce, they were getting married, they were putting a kid through college, they wanted to buy a car, they wanted to buy a boat, they wanted to buy a home, and they had plenty of reasons to sell the stock, and it, often it had nothing to do with the stock itself. So I think the charts definitely lead the way. Uh, plus one on paper trade, I think uh, Jason was talking about that, and, and Ed mentioned it too, uh, but also eventually you're going to have to put a little real money on the line. Take your time. The secret is there is no secret. In fact, I've got a little one-page uh, report. Uh, thanks for mentioning reports because I've got a couple of reports out there, but I've got a one-page report. I can also make it available to everyone. Um, you can get it off my website, davelander.com, or just email me directly, or maybe a, a Dave Cosmeter could put it up on Time and Research. I'd be happy to give it to him. Uh, it's seven secrets of trading, and, and the first one is I'm not gonna I'm not gonna uh, spoiler alert, but it ruined the whole thing. But uh, the first one is a secret: is there is no secret. Uh, keep things simple. Take your time. Uh, on my website, also I have a getting started into education, and I'd recommend that if you want to, if you're a musician and you want to get better, be a musician that you uh, practice your instrument. And I think that if you want to get better looking at charts, you should look at charts and learn how to read the read the charts simply by looking at a lot of charts. Don't put a whole lot of indicators on your chart at first and try not to put any if you, if you can stand it and just look at a blank chart. And the more charts you look at, the more feel you'll get for the market. I look at two or 3,000 charts every day. The way I do that, I use a, a package called Telechart. I'm actually a distributor for them, um, but they found me long before uh, you know, I, I was promoting them a long time ago. Anyway, the point, the reason I like them, and if you could do this in any other package, you could do the same thing, is I just like to, I could just hit the space bar and flip through hundreds of charts really, really quick. And it really gives you a feel for what's going on 
within the market. You can look at the Rusty 2000, and that's uh, that gives you a good idea. But when you go in and actually look at a couple thousand stocks, you get a good feel too. So um, this is a, 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 a question that's come up on the show in several ways, shapes, and forms. So I think we could all talk for hours on it, so I, I don't want to filibuster here. But again, uh, plus one on what Jason said about the psychology uh, of it all. And a lot of times, again, it's, it's, it's your own personal psychology. That could be kind of tough. Uh, trade, like you said, bus fare. Trade at such a small size, it's almost meaningless. It seems like many people get in this business for excitement. Uh, I, I tell my client, once you start doing it properly, it, it, it you'll reach a point where it's almost boring. And, and, and some of them don't want to hear that. People will quit. If the market gets choppy and conditions get really poor and, and there's no trend whatsoever, I won't recommend any new stocks. And you know what? I'll lose clients. And when I ask them why, they said uh, they want more action. So... Rather than give them action, I'm going to tell them what they need to hear and not what they want to hear or want to do. But um, just take your time, and sometimes sometimes sitting on your hands is a thing to do. Okay, um, Ed, let's go back to you. Any closing thoughts, anything else you want to tell us about your trading, the markets, or SeattleTacticalAdvisors.com? Oh, Dave, I, I can't let this go. You're, uh, go ahead. You're, you're quoting Tom McClellan. Uh, yeah. My all-time favorite quote comes from his mother, Marion McClellan. Oh, I know the quote. I almost said it, but I couldn't, I didn't, I couldn't quote it properly. Yeah, please, tell it's, us the quote. It's solely tangentially related to your point, yeah. but it's still worth it's, repeating. It's beautiful, because I told Tom, I emailed Tom and said, Tom, you have no idea how many times I quote you. And he goes, I got one better from my mom, Marion. So go ahead, Ed. Yeah, it's, it goes like this. Everyone times the market. Some people buy when they have money and sell when they need money. Others use methods that are more sophisticated. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, plus one on that. Ed, yeah. It, Ed and I, just so you guys know, we're all running the same circles. We're all in the uh, American Association of Professional Technical yeah. Analysts uh, right. together yeah. in here. Good. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. I was going to quote, but I didn't want to misquote it. But uh, I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, anyway, um, I'll just I'll just log off by saying uh, SeattleTechnicalAdvisors.com. Come on by the website. Take a look. Um, anybody that's on this call today, feel free to hit me with an email and I'll send you a free copy of the March Lindsay report. Okay, fantastic. We appreciate that. I'll um, I'll hit you with an email too. I'd like to take a look at that too. All right. And appreciate it. All right, Jason Jankowski of the liononline.net. Any closing thoughts? Could be about your trading, about the markets, or about uh, your website, the liononline. Sure. Dot net. Well, yeah, obviously I'm always looking to uh, meet new traders and, and form relationships. So for those of you that are listening out there that uh, have something I've said has resonated with you and you can uh, kind of cross that bridge that says, yeah, I, I really do need to work on my psychology a little better, I would uh, encourage you to, to start a relationship with me. It's very simple. Just go to my website, The Lion Online, um, uh, and there's a contact me form on there. All you have to do is fill it out and send it in. And I'll be happy. I'm still the only guy in this business that answers his own phone. You know, I'd be more yeah. than happy to take a few <laughs> minutes with you. Yeah, I really would. And you know, I've got a lot of resources that uh, can get you started in the right direction. If you feel that trading forex is what you want to do, and you're doing it now, and you you really want to learn more, I do a, a daily global forex squawk broadcast where I'm in uh, talking about the markets all day long to my customer base. And uh, I also do um, you know a tremendous. Uh, uh, graduate level deep immersion course on trader psychology that's coming up in Q2 and I'll have all the details available on that for anyone who's interested um, cool. but as far yeah. as as far as the closing thought you know I, I gotta say you know the most important thing is uh, you, you've got to uh, start slow and start carefully and that's that's really the most important thing otherwise you just get excited you have the the worst thing that could happen is that you make money on your first handful of trades worst yeah thing. Yeah, I would, I would never, no, and, and you know what? I would. That's that's so that's so true because uh, the people, my clients that come in when the market is trending, they tell me how wonderful I am, and I don't know for a fact, but I have the feeling that I know a few people actually quit their day jobs thinking that yeah, this, not a good idea. Why I've worked so hard all these years, and you know what? As soon as the market gets choppy, they send me a very nasty email, which is just the opposite of what they were saying a few months ago. So yeah, markets go up, and markets go down, and markets go sideways. Amen. Uh, real quick, Jason, uh, we're kind of running a little long here, but uh, just, I'm just curious, what's your time frame in Forex? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I, I would say that it, it's very similar to how you described it. And when I get what I call a signal or an indication it's time to go long or short, 
I'm I'm literally hoping that that's the last time the market's ever at that price. You know, so like, we're we're looking to be selling. My me and my crew we're looking to be selling dollars up into these highs. We I really think it's overdone now. That might be a, a week long correction. Uh, that might be a four or five month long correction. Uh, what if it's the high for the year, and then maybe next year uh, we're even lower? I mean, I I would try to find a way to stay with it. So my time frame for execution is you know 60 minute 120 minute you know higher time frames to find the spot and then I'm using daily weekly monthly time frames to try and hold the position so my actual execution is done with a, a different look than hold, managing the trade managing the trade is that we need to try to stay on this thing forever like Livermore said you don't he never made any money trading he made his money sitting tight so we want to sit tight when we can you know and, and I don't know how long that's gonna be but I do know I share your view you can't really Analyze or predict uh, markets more than about three days out. Yeah, you really can't, you know. And so if something happens and all of a sudden, you know, you got a 400 point lead on something three days later, I'm not looking to get out of that. I'm going to try that. So something happening. So can we hold this? Can I add to it? And yeah. if it's still there a month later, I'm in. You know. Yeah, I mean, it's there's I could go on and on on so many things that you just said. And, and one thing is is let the market make the decisions for you. Don't try to outsmart the market. And then, like uh, Miss Marion said, uh, don't let those reasons be because you have to or, or right. you think you need to or whatever. Let the market decide. And if that if that uh, dollar tops out and you're short, stay short for the next ten years. And and amen and plus one on that. Uh, and, and again, we've you know. I always have a blast with these shows. We could probably talk for the next three hours. But, uh, Jim, once again, you're wait, waiting patiently over there. Any uh, any closing thoughts? Anything else you want to tell us uh, about your trading, yourself, the markets, or optionprofessor.com? Well, on the, uh, on the um, options end, you know, options can be used to create the cash flow by writing strategies. It could be used for limited risk uh, leverage speculation on the buy side, and it can also be used for hedging. So there's a lot to learn, and a lot of guys think they know quite a bit more about them than they do, so it's quite uh, interesting to, if people do take the time to go learn more. And at theoptionprofessor.com, the DVDs will be very helpful. One of the strategies that I think in the next 18 months, which is way longer than you guys are talking, because there's no evidence of any kind of a turn basis to moving averages on a long-term basis. But as time goes by, if we stay range-bound 2250, 1800, and the market kind of goes back and forth, these averages will catch up with the price and at some point they may flatten out and then of course roll over not dissimilar to 2008 and it would possibly coincide with the exit of Mr. Obama in 2016 as it did coincide with the exits of Bush in 08 and 2000 with Clinton and 87 88 with Reagan so yeah. you know uh, it, it would be very helpful for people to learn these hedging strategies using collars and married puts and things <laughs> like that that could come in handy uh, further down the road all of that stuff is covered on the option DVDs so some strategies might be of a short-term nature or interest now and then some on a longer term basis but uh, that's what I would suggest people educate themselves on uh, in a number of environments because as we as we go down the road uh, the environments will probably change yeah Jim I, I, I think with especially options but trading in general but uh, again especially options I think once you know what you don't know I think that's what true enlightenment enlightenment begins to um, begins to come to you uh, in, in the options market. So I like what you said. A lot of people uh, think they know, but but they don't. And, and, and it's funny, you know, this, the longer you're in this business, the more humble you become. And once you know what you don't know, I think it's is when you uh, you really be, start becoming successful. Okay, David, I appreciate uh, you having me on as host again. Let me go ahead and turn the show back to David Cosminer, uh, timingresearch.com. Thank you, David. All right. Uh, thanks, guys. Great show. Um, just want to remind everyone who's watching to go to timingresearch.com slash reports, and you can download any of the uh, past reports there. Um, and also, sometime before uh, next Sunday, um, please go to timingresearch.com slash current survey. Fill out the, uh, the next survey there. And uh, I just want to thank my guest, Ed Carlson of seattletechnicaladvisors.com. Jason Jankowski of the Lion Online dot net, and Jim Kenny of OptionProfessor.com, and of course Dave Landry of DaveLandry.com, guest hosting for me again. Thanks for thanks for being back, and uh, so thanks guys. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it.